you would like to open your Bibles with me this morning to Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. You can do so. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. Because today we really stand at the crossroads of conviction and courage where the clarion call of the gospel resonates with an unwavering urgency. God summons us not merely to occupy space in this world, but to inhabit it with a boldness born of faith, a conviction unwavering against the ebb and flow of societal tides. And as the Apostle Paul, chained in Roman confinement, penned his heartfelt epistle to the Philippians, his words truly reverberate throughout history echoing in the chambers of our hearts today. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, he implores, igniting this, this flame within us that beckons us to a life lived in profound alignment with the gospel's transformative power. And in the tapestry of Paul's words woven with the divine thread lies an appeal that transcends the confines of time a call to stand firm, resolute in our conduct, unified in purpose, and unwavering in defense of the Christian faith. And so today as we look into the depths of Philippians 1.27, a, a beacon illuminating the path of our Christian pilgrimage, within these verses resides the blueprint for standing firm. Not in stubborn rigidity, but in the steadfastness of conviction, the unity of purpose, and the unwavering commitment to defend the gospel. And so as we embark on this journey of exploration and conviction, a journey that beckons us to stand not as passive spectators, but as brave defenders of the faith in the unfolding chapters of this divine mandate, lies the roadmap to a life lived in harmony with the gospel's call, a call to stand firm again and defend the faith. And so I pray that God will stir our hearts and illuminate our minds and, and fortify our spirits as we dive into this divine charge, which beckons us again to stand resolute. Let's go ahead and read Philippians 1 verse 27 together. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We notice that they are standing firm in unity. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Standing firm begins with our conduct. Paul implores the Philippians to live in a manner befitting the gospel's magnificent, uh, magnificence. This call echoes again through the corridors of time resonating in our lives today. Now, how do we align our behavior with the gospel? How do we do that? The first is to have consistent integrity. Consistent integrity. Living out the gospel demands consistency in our conduct, irrespective of circumstances. There are so many people who they act one way when things are going great. And they are fantastic, faithful Christians when things are going well. But the other time, when they enter into a trial in their life, they set down their faith and they try every which way but God. We need to stand firm. It demands consistent integrity. Paul's unwavering commitment to Christ exemplifies this consistency, whether in abundance or scarcity. Our conduct amidst trial speaks volumes about the depth of our conviction. Consistent integrity and a unified purpose. Standing firm necessitates a unified purpose within the body of Christ. 
You think of a symphony, for example, the the blending of these different instruments, strings and and winds, and, and they're creating this beautiful melody. Likewise, despite our differences, the unity within the church presents a compelling testament to the gospel's unifying power. That though we may disagree on minor things, things that are not issues of salvation, but just issues of opinion, that we can still become one, that we are still unified by the gospel of Christ. That these little things that are just opinion and not doctrine, that in the end, they don't matter. But in God, in Christ, we have one purpose. We are of one spirit. We are of one mind. That's when we stand firm. And the call to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, it's not just some external display, but it's the overflow of a transformed heart. Paul stresses the integrity of life entwined with the unity of purpose within the body of believers. You might think of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. Now I exhort you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, when it's talking there about you all agree and there's no divisions, it doesn't mean you can't have an opinion, that I can't have an opinion, but it's saying that our opinions should not divide the body. Man's opinions should not be the reason that a congregation falls. Man's opinions should not be the reason that people don't want to become Christians. Y'all know that sometimes your life is the only sermon some will ever hear, some will ever see. And it's not a very good sermon if you're inconsistent and if you're wavering. James says, you know, about asking about for wisdom in your trials, but he said, let him ask in faith, not wavering, not in doubt. Because that man, he is like a a ship in the sea being tossed back and forth. He's a double-minded man, unstable. He doesn't know what he actually wants. He wants this from God one minute and this from God the next minute. And in between, he wants it from the world. But in this verse... Paul urges unity among believers, emphasizing the importance of harmony within the body of Christ. And it underscores the need for believers to be unified in purpose and mindset, reflecting the unity that strengthens their ability to stand firm. Just as a lighthouse stands firm amid those raging seas and and it's guiding those ships safely to shore, our unified stand as believers, it it serves as a beacon of hope, trying to guide those those lost souls toward the unchanging truth of the gospel. See, those lost souls, they're they're that ship, they're that little dinghy that's out there and the storm is raging and they're looking for a port in a storm. They're looking for hope and the Christian stands firm, letting our light shine before men so that they may see our good works and glorify God. And that way, when they're in life's stormy seas, they say, there's hope. There's someone standing firm. Let me make my way toward that. And then they come to the shore and they realize the concreteness of the love of God, the concreteness of the gospel. Let me ask you a question. How does our conduct reflect the gospel's transformative power in our lives? And how does our unity as believers impact our ability to stand firm? I'll tell you, our conduct is the tangible expression of the gospel's transformative power. When our actions align with the principles of the gospel, exhibiting love, kindness, humility, and grace, we showcase the change Christ has wrought within us. The transformation becomes a living testimony, 
drawing others to inquire about the source of such profound change. Mike, you weren't the same way that you were 10 years ago. What happened? Did you get therapy? Did you find some type of self-help guru or something like that? Mike, you weren't the same a week ago. Two weeks ago, what's changed? What's different about you? Let me tell you about Christ. And let me tell you about what the power of the gospel can do no matter what station you are in your life. Unity among believers plays a pivotal role in our ability to stand firm. Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 12, you might want to jot that down. Just as a single strand may be easily broken, but a cord of three or of many is unbreakable. You standing alone, you, you, take, a, you take a stick, that's you alone, you can break it. You take 50, 100 of them in your hand, that's not so easily broken. That's the unity of believers. We need to be living out the gospel. Living out the gospel, that accentuates the imperative nature of aligning our conduct with the gospel's transformative power, not aligning our conduct with the world. And it underscores that our behavior is a living testimony, showcasing again the gospel's impact on our lives. Don't you want to impact people? If you don't, you don't even need to be here. Now, you, you might expect that in a, maybe a larger congregation. Thousand people, you know, plenty of money in the bank, plenty of money in the contribution each week. You might expect the preacher to say, you know what, you don't need to be here if you're not going to do anything. Why? Because there's plenty of money, there's plenty of people and everything else. I'll tell a crowd of three people, if you're not in it for Christ, you don't need to show up. Jesus showed up. We need to do the same. We need to be unified in our purpose. We need to live out the gospel in our lives. Don't you want people to change? You know, the atheist Penn, Tell Penn uh, you know Penn and Teller, the magicians? Penn, he, he's an atheist, ardent atheist. And even he said, how much do you have to hate someone to believe that if they die, they go to a place of eternal torment and you not tell them something? Even an atheist says that. How much? Calling out Christians. Now, normally they call out Christians, maybe, oh, you're stupid because you believe in this book or you believe in this fairy tale or whatever. No, he calls out Christians to say, how much do you people who claim to exhibit love, to believe in God, to believe in the God of love, how much do you people have to hate someone to not tell them about Jesus? I can't disagree with them. Not on that point. Our unity is a testimony to the world that Jesus Christ was sent by God. Second thing, defending the faith. Latter portion there, Philippians 1, 27, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Paul urges the Philippians to stand firm in conduct and emphasizes the crucial need to defend the faith vigorously. In a world besieged by skepticism and opposition, how do we effectively defend the gospel? Now, I know that's not something that I will say a, a, a typical Christian worries about. And I say typical Christian not in a disparaging way, but in a factual way, in the sense that most people in the pews, they say that defending of the gospel, that's the preacher's job. That's what we pay him for. Or that's the elder's job. Because he's the one, Titus chapter 1 says, is supposed to be defending something. Let me tell you something. You put on the blood of Christ in baptism, you have your sins washed away, that's your job. That's every Christian's job, is to defend the faith. But how do we do that? Unwavering conviction. Unwavering conviction. 
The defense of the faith demands an unwavering conviction rooted in a deep understanding of God's word. And you're not going to get a deep understanding if you never open your Bible, if you never show up to services, if you never get out and talk to people about Christ. Your understanding will be so shallow that if you stood on the floor and jumped up, you'd hit your head on the underside of the bed. We've got to get in the word of God. And then I'll just plug in everything like that. The class on Sunday mornings, we're going through how to study the Bible, how to exegete a text. If you'd like to come, that's at 930. <coughs> just as a sturdy foundation supports a towering structure, a robust comprehension of Scripture fortifies our defense against doctrinal challenges. You know, I like watching medieval movies you know, medieval shows, a fascination with fortresses and, you know, uh, castles and just the dark ages in general. You know, it's just kind of interesting to me and how uh, they would always, you know, have plans of how a castle was laid out. And if you watch any of these movies, when there's this imminent attack coming, there's apparently some schematic that's been lost since the castle was built that shows a weak point in the in the castle you know and that's where they always attack it doesn't matter uh, what it is but there's always something that's hidden there right and the one who's able to defend is the one who not only knows the basic outline but one who knows about those hidden passages and those traps and what have you where the enemy is going to strike we have to have that about the gospel it's not good enough to just know that the boss gospel that the word of god because it's all good news it's not good enough to just know that the Bible has 66 books. It's not good enough to just know that there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. That's, that's not going to cut it. You're not going to be able to stand on that. We need that sturdy foundation. Not only do we need an unwavering conviction for defending the faith, but we need what's called engaged cooperation. That word engaged there stands out. Standing firm necessitates a collaborative effort within the body of believers. Engaged, that means an active participant. Not just that you show up, but that you show up with the mindset, the attitude, and the heart of wanting to get involved. And I'm not just talking about church growth or, some, or, or a potluck or anything like that. I'm talking about being engaged in wanting to see the will of God done. We look at this letter written by a man who was beheaded. And we think of the deaths at least the traditional deaths that we are aware of, of many of the apostles being speared or burned in oil or, 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 or banished to an island. And yet, and yet, they believed and they were engaged. You look at Acts chapter 5 and you've got Peter and John and they're in prison. And they were in prison. Why? Because they were preaching the gospel. And they said, look, you need to stop doing that. You need to stop talking about Jesus. You're going to go to jail. You're going to get killed. And then in verse 29 of Acts chapter 5, we ought to obey God rather than men. And yet we have today Christians who won't walk across the street to talk to their neighbor about Christ. If your neighbor's house was on fire at 3 o'clock in the morning and they're in there sleeping, would you run out there, ring the doorbell? You know, try, try, to, try to get them to the door, try to get them out. Maybe if you're strong enough, or maybe you've just got that, that testosterone or, and all this type of stuff just kind of pumping, and you kick in the door and you drag them out of their bed. Yeah, they're going to come kicking and screaming, but you saved their life. Yeah, well, what good is that if you've let their soul slip? Who cares how long of a life we live it's a, if it's a life without Christ? There has to be engagement 
When facing opposition, unified cooperation among believers, it amplifies the effectiveness of our defense. An interlocked defense. Each believer playing their part forms an impenetrable wall against attacks on, on faith. You're defending a castle. You can't just have one guy up there on the wall. You think of those things, right? It's like, oh, they're coming. Archers on the wall. Archers, plural. Right? Not just archer. Yep. You know? And sometimes it can seem overwhelming. We are in the smaller group, right? Make no mistake about it. There's a little bit over 2.3 billion quote-unquote Christians in the world. Say air quotes, that's everybody in Christendom. There's 8 billion people on the planet. We are not in the majority. It's like we're at the Alamo or something, you know? But we've still got to make a stand. To defend the faith effectively, we have to couple deep-rooted convictions in God's truth with a cooperative engagement within the church. And it's not merely an individual endeavor, but a collective responsibility. So, for so many years, I didn't grow up in the church. I was, I was, I was reared Southern Baptist. Y'all know that. But I'm going to tell you something. Just on my study of church history, for far too long, the church has replaced autonomy with isolation. We've said every congregation is its own congregation, and we've taken that to mean we don't do anything else. We don't support one another. We don't stand with one another. Yeah. And yet numbers have been dwindling over the years. Let me ask this question. Are you surprised at all? You shouldn't be. You really shouldn't be. That is just plain old stupid. Unintelligent thinking to say we can stand over here by ourselves, not help anybody else, not care about any other congregation, and then wonder, where'd they all go? Beloved, while I was making every effort. He says here in Jude 1 and verse 3, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Contend earnestly, vigorously for the faith that was handed down to the saints. It's already there. That's what we're supposed to be defending. Not some new doctrine because there is no new doctrine. I agree with John Knox. He sat there and he said there is no private revelation. If private revelation agrees with scripture, then it's not needed. And if it doesn't agree with scripture, then it's false. We have everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness, Peter says. Jude's letter, it exhorts believers to contend earnestly for the faith that they received. And it highlights the need for an active defense of the gospel. Urging believers to fight for the truths entrusted to them. Emphasizing the importance of defending the faith against challenges and falsehoods. You think of a, a team of skilled architects, they're all collaborating to, to fortify a structure against storms. The, the unified efforts of believers fortify the church against the onslaught of doubts and, and falsehoods. One person cannot do it all. You just, you just look at Christians, that's why you'll have some who will focus on apologetics and defending the gospel in this front. You'll have others that focus on debating individuals. Even within apologetics, you'll have some that will focus on creation and others that will focus on this. That's why you have people who focus on church history. You have people who focus on the New Testament, people who focus on the Old Testament. Because one person cannot do it all. I don't care how great of a preacher that they are. It doesn't work that way. But when we're all working in our areas and with our talents, we are, we are fortifying that structure. We are building it brick by brick 
by brick. And we ask, how, do our, how does our understanding of Scripture and, and cooperative efforts within the body of believers strengthen our ability to do that? Let me tell you, understanding Scripture equips us with the necessary tools for defense. A skilled craftsman with a well-honed tool, a profound understanding of Scripture, sharpens our defense against doctrinal errors and challenges to the faith. How am I supposed to defend against this? Study your Bible. Study that and you'll learn how to defend against that. But don't say, but the question for many people is, how am I supposed to defend this? With the answer being, I don't know. You never open your Bible. Of course you're not going to be able to defend against it. The devil loves nothing more than a dusty Bible. When believers diligently study and comprehend the word collectively, their shared knowledge strengthens the church's defense against false teaching or doubts. How often have you learned something based off of someone else's study? Right? I don't know. I mean, we have classes Saturday mornings at 930, Wednesdays at 7. Hopefully we're learning something. And how many times have people learned from you? It's not just about what we learn, but it's about the knowledge that others can impart to us, that we can impart to each other. And moreover, cooperative efforts within the body of believers, they create a robust defense network. Each believer contributing their unique strengths, some with deep theological understanding, others with practical wisdom. It, it creates this cohesive defense mechanism. And this collaborative effort combines diverse perspectives and, and gifts, making the defense of faith multifaceted and resilient. Scriptural understanding and cooperation. Again, the point underscores here the crucial aspects of understanding Scripture deeply and the necessity of collaborative efforts within the body. C.S. Lewis once said, Christianity is, is a statement which is a false of no consequence. And if true of infinite importance, the one thing it cannot be is moderately important. It's either not important at all or it's infinitely important. It's not in between. The last point is standing firm through adversity. Philippians 1, 28 through 30, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. I want to pause before verse 30. In no way alarmed by your opponents. Why? Because you're standing firm. Because you studied, you are embedded in the Word of God, and the Word of God is embedded in you. Experiencing, he says in verse 30, the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Paul's words reveal an often overlooked reality that standing firm often accompanies adversity and suffering. How do we stand firm when placed with opposition and suffering? We've talked about conviction, but there's also an unshaken courage. Unshaken courage. Standing firm amidst adversity demands unshaken courage born out of a trust in God's sovereignty. God is in control. Make no doubt about it. And we have to firmly Trust in that. We have to have the courage to believe that God is in control, come what may. Like Paul, who faced imprisonment and opposition, our courage stems from an unwavering trust that God is in control, even when we can't see it, even when we can't understand it. God's there for the faithful. He will not suffer the righteous to be moved. And there is a joyful endurance that comes with this. Standing firm through suffering, it requires joyful endurance. Viewing hardships as opportunities for spiritual growth. Now, I know that's hard. 
I know that's hard. I am in the midst of trial, and you want me to be happy about it? Really? That doesn't make any sense. That defies all logic. But let me tell you something. There's a lot in the gospel that defies logic. He who loses his life will find it. Really? But see, that's what stands out. See, when you're in the middle of a trial, what does the world expect? They expect you to curse your circumstances. They expect you to blame someone else and not take ownership of it. They expect you to feel desperate, like there is no hope. But with joy, with this, un, with this joyful endurance, it, it causes them to just stop and look. Why are you so happy? Because you know what, in my trial, I have to pray more. And prayer gets me closer to God. Because in my trials, I have to trust God more. And that gets me closer to God. And that's why Paul said, I can rejoice in my suffering. When, when God said, my grace is sufficient for you, he said, okay, then I can rejoice because it's drawing me closer to you. I might not understand it. I might not even make it through it. Because some trials we don't. Some trials end a life. But if it gets me closer to God, then isn't that the goal? Joy and suffering, it's not a natural inclination, but it's a mark of our faith. And it demonstrates that our hope transcends our present circumstances. The paradox of suffering and standing firm illuminates that adversity is not a sign of defeat, but it's an opportunity to display an unwavering trust and joy in God's sovereignty. So many people, they think that, oh, you're defeated because you're down on your knees. No, I'm on my knees because I am victorious. It's kind of like, it's kind of like that, um, that poster that you might see sometime, and it generally has an image of a person on their knees, and it says something to the effect of, the devil saw me down, and he saw me crying, and he saw me sweating, and he saw me, and he said, you're defeated, you're worthless, you can't do anything. And then he paused when he heard me say, Amen. We're not on our knees because we're defeated. We're on our knees because we're getting closer to God. And not only this, Romans 5, 3 through 5, it's not up there, just jot it down. Not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proving character. And proving character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given, been given to us. That passage there, Romans 5, it illuminates the purpose of suffering in the life of the believer. Suffering has a purpose. It's not random. It shows that our response shapes our character among our tribulations, leading to a steadfast hope in God. It emphasizes that suffering, rather than weakening us, can produce resilience and hope through God's love poured into our hearts by the Spirit. Just as a tree's roots go, you know, you think about the tree, and it's in the middle of the storm. And the reason that it's not breaking is because it has such deep roots. Our faith strengthens amid trials, enabling us to grow deep roots and to stand firm and bear fruit, even in adversity. How does our response to suffering, how does our response to uh, adversity reflect our faith? And how does God use these moments to strengthen our standing? 
Our response to suffering is a testament to the depth of our faith. When faced with trials, if we cling to hope, maintain joy amidst pain, and exhibit endurance without wavering in our faith, it showcases our unwavering trust in God's sovereignty. And that response demonstrates that our faith transcends circumstances because we are rooted firmly not in the world but in the unchanging character of God. God uses moments of adversity as refining fires to strengthen our standing. Just as fire purifies gold, trials refine and strengthen our faith. These experiences deepen our reliance on God, molding us into vessels that are fit for His purposes. There are so many people who they, who they, they don't come to Christ because they say, you know what, I've got to get my life right. And then, I'll, and then I'll get with God. Let me tell you something. The whole reason you get with God is because your life's not right. You can't get it right. Our good works, Scripture says, are filthy rags. It's by God's grace that you've been saved. Not your works, Ephesians 2, 8 and following. We deepen our reliance on God. He molds us to be fit for His purposes. To be a workman that need not be ashamed. A workman rooted in Scripture who can rightly divide the word of truth. God uses adversity not to break us, but to build us up. To fortify our faith and making us more resilient and standing firm for the gospel. How do I know the difference between temptation and trial? Temptation is from the devil and tries to lead me away from God. Trial draws me closer to him. These answers reveal that our conduct, our understanding, our responses to suffering, unity within the body of believers, they're intertwined elements here that we see in Philippians 1 and verse 27 that significantly impact our ability to stand firm and defend the Christian faith. The point highlights our response to suffering is a crucial indicator of our faith's depth, underscoring endurance, joy, trust in God, amidst trials, pivotal elements in standing firm, each and every one. And it also illustrates how these moments serve as refining opportunities. So as we conclude, I just want us to think and commit ourselves to stand firm, unwavering in our conduct, robust in our defense, engaged cooperation, Per persistent in adversity. May our lives echo Paul's sincere desire to hear of believers standing firm. Wouldn't that be wonderful to say, you know what, it's been a while since I've been at Freetown Road, but I am so thankful for you because I hear you're standing firm. John Newton an amazing grace said trials are medicines which are great which our gracious and wise physician prescribes because we need them and he proportions the frequency and weight of them to what the case requires friends this call resounds with undiminished urgency it is just as important today as it was then the apostolic charge to stand firm, resolute in conduct, stalwart in defense, and unwavering in the face of adversity. Yet in this pursuit of standing firm, there exists a vital truth that beckons us to put aside the trifles and, uh, you know, these trivial things that sow discord among us. We've got to get rid of that stuff. It doesn't belong in the Lord's church. The, those inconsequential things that divide rather than unite. People argue so much about things that have nothing to do with salvation. 
Our unity, not in trivialities, but in the gospel of Christ, is the beacon that guides people through the storms in this world. And with enthusiasm and humility, I think we need to set aside those notes of worldly controversies that distract us from the pure melody of the gospel. Not disputing over those things that don't matter. Our differences in secondary convictions should not overshadow our shared belief in the essential truths of Scripture. Instead, we need to lock arms in unity, standing shoulder to shoulder, unified in our devotion to Christ, relentless in our defense of the truth. The world watches not for the perfection of our agreement on non-essentials, but for the beauty of our harmony in the essentials. The Apostle Paul implored the Corinthians, may, be, may we be of one mind in judgment in Christ, for in that unity lies our strength. Our unity in Christ is a testimony to a watching world. The gospel transcends every barrier, unites every heart, and transforms every life. And I pray that our unity in the gospel resounds louder than the noise of our disagreements. And as we stand firm, we need to stand united, exemplifying the transformative power of Christ. Let us, because it can only start here, but let us with one voice, one purpose, and one heart stand firm, standing as a formidable bastion of unwavering faith, undivided by the uh, trivial things of this world. And in that unity, we'll find strength. And I pray that may may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, God's love and the Holy Spirit's fellowship be with us all. And if you're here this morning and you want to know how to become a Christian, you can come forward as we sing and we can talk about that. Maybe you want to study afterwards. If you're here as a member of the body of Christ, And you need the prayers of the congregation because you haven't been unified. You've been divided. You've been that unstable man James talks about. But you need the prayers of the congregation. We'll pray with you and for you under the throne of Almighty God. If there's anything at all. And by the way, doesn't have to be me. Doesn't have to be me. Any one of the members here would be happy to talk to you if you would like that. And the, the invitation to heaven is open 3, 365, 24-7, 365. The gates never close. But if there's anything we can do and you would like to make it known publicly, then you can do so by coming forward as together we stand and as we sing.